Tonight's big story is a historic first. The Philippines, U.S., Japan, and Australia hold maritime drills in the West Philippine Sea in a show of unity amid heightened tensions against China. But Vice President Sara Duterte says no comment when asked about responding to China's growing aggression in the disputed waters. A by and far, the list says it's traitorous. And we will be speaking to former Ilocosur Governor Chavit Singh Son after his vehicle was flagged for using the EDSA busway earlier today. Welcome to the show. I'm Regina Lay. I'm Gretchen Ho. And I'm Sean Yao. The Philippines, Japan, Australia and the United States held joint military drills over in the South China Sea yesterday known as the Multilateral Maritime Cooperative Activity or MMCA. All the planned exercises were conducted within the country's exclusive economic zone. Officials from the four nations were quick to stress that this was not a show of force against China, but was meant to uphold freedom of navigation and overflight in the disputed territories. Still, two Chinese People's Liberation Army ships were spotted in the distance during the MMCA. All this comes just days before President Marcos heads off to Washington, D.C. for a historic trilateral summit with U.S. President Joe Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, where boosting defense ties is top of the agenda. Brian Castillo with tonight's big story. Okay. Ladies, defense officials have refrained from branding this four-nation maritime exercise between the Philippines, U.S., Japan, and Australia as a show of force. Instead, they're calling it as a show of unity. But we cannot discount the fact that this is a historic first for the Philippines, coming at a crucial time when we're seeing increasing maritime aggression from China. Just like a scene from an action movie, the multilateral maritime cooperative activity went from sea to air, going from south to north. Several maritime and air assets of the four countries participated in the joint drills in the West Philippine Sea this weekend. Representing the Philippines was the missile frigate BRP Antonio Luna and the Philippine Navy patrol ship BRP Valentin Diaz. Joining them was the combat ship USS Mobile of the United States Navy the Australian frigate HMAS Warabunga, and the Japanese destroyer JS Akebono. The activities conducted include communication and maneuver exercises, as well as submarine detection using a Philippine Navy helicopter. The anti-submarine warfare drill is actually uh, just sensing kung may mga presence na mga underwater uh, vessels. No? May mga sensors tayo. The drills seek to enhance military forces' ability to work together effectively in different maritime situations. This exercise also showed uh, how to uh, demonstrate professional interactions uh, between our forces and to strengthen our interoperability. Meanwhile, the AFP confirmed that two Chinese Navy vessels were also seen observing the drills from a distance. Mga six nautical miles away. No? Medyo medyo malayo rin yung distansya nila. Hindi naman sila, hindi katulad nung mga rore operations natin na talagang dumidikit sila. No? Halos uh, banggahin pa yung mga ships natin. The armed forces insist that the activity wasn't meant to send a message to China. Hindi naman show of force ito. This is not uh, directed against any uh, country. President Marcos also insists that the joint drills are not meant to provoke tension. He says they continue to reach out to Beijing for high-level diplomatic talks. Lahat ng maari natin gawin, ginagawa natin para kausap ang Chinese leadership, ang Beijing, uh, makausap sila. Na, wag na natin masyadong papainitin pa. Uh, Pag-usap tayo na mabuti para walang banggaan, walang kanon, walang water kanon. Uh, hindi, hindi, tayo, hindi, hindi na mabalik sa ganun. China, for its part, is conducting its own combat training in the South China Sea. They also issued a statement saying all military activities disrupting the South China Sea situation and creating buzzes are under control. The four countries stressed that the activity was, quote, in support of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Whether or not this deters China remains to be seen. All we know for sure at this point is that the historic four-nation maritime drills were considered a success having concluded with no untoward incidents. Back to you. Thank you so much for that, Brian Castillo.
Ito nga, another incident out there. The Philippine Coast Guard reported that they and the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources encountered Chinese ships while conducting food security operations last Thursday. This time, it was at Rosal Reef, which lies within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Gio Robles with the story. China flexing its muscles yet again, this time in Rectobank. PCG and BIFAR vessels escorted civilian fishing boats deploying fish aggregating devices, locally known as Payao, around Rosul Reef on Thursday. 25 fishing boats from Quezon, a town three hours away from Puerto Princesa, the capital of Palawan, joined the four-day mission at sea. This time, two China Coast Guard ships blocked and carried out dangerous maneuvers against Filipino vessels. Aerial video from the PCG shows how a China Coast Guard ship tried to go after several fishing boats. A warship from Chinese Navy also issued radio challenges to Filipino ships. Chinese level warship calling on your Chinese level warship. But PCG and BIFAR personnel were undeterred. Chinese Navy warship. This is Philippine government vessel. The ABR MN4B51. We're conducting routine maritime patrol within the Philippine exclusive economic zone. We are proceeding to our plan room. Stay clear from our passage in accordance with the collision regulations. Over. While no one was hurt, a fisherman who joined the mission admitted to News 5 that this incident has long been happening. Yun, sir, yung ginagawa nila pag nakikita nila kami, lumalapit sila sa amin bago nang nagatakbo sa gilid bago biglang man yung uber sa harap. Another fisherman recalled their close encounter with China Coast Guard personnel, adding that their livelihood has been greatly affected by China's illegal actions over their traditional fishing grounds. So, nung mga una-unang biyahe namin, meron din na, na nangaras na, binawaan kami ng minsan, parang naiyakit talaga sa ano mo na Delikado ang buhay na ano, pero wala tayong magagawa dyan kasi trabaho man natin. Apart from abundant marine resources, experts say Rectobank is an untapped natural resource as it may hold rich natural gas and oil deposits. The disputed area is being claimed by China along with other important features in the West Philippine Sea. PCG spokesperson for the West Philippine Sea, Commodore Jay Tariela, echoed President Bongbong Marcos's orders to remain professional in dealing with China despite its provocations and harassments in our waters. Tariela maintained that the Philippines will never use force and illegal actions to counter China's attacks. The guidance of the president is very clear. We should be um, maintaining our temper in responding to these provocative actions of the Chinese Coast Guard. And we should still be professional in dealing with them. We don't intend to escalate the tension. No? Uh, we don't want to um, incite um, any conflict with any countries. Back in Quezon Town, Palawan, residents who rely on fishing remain hopeful that they can return to Recto Bank freely without China's shadow within our territory. Sana naman ma yung atin para Yung Pilipinas rin pa yung makinabang. Hindi yung Pilipinas nga tayo. Tapos ibang bansa naman yung umaani ng yaman natin. Tapos yung taga dito sa atin, wala na. Hanggang tingin na lang. For News 5, Gio Robles, we are One News. And Vice President Sara Duterte has finally broken her silence over the West Philippine Sea issue. Well, somewhat. On the sidelines of an event earlier today, this is all that the VP had to say when asked about it. No comment. No comment. I think comprehensive na yung uh, statement ni Congressman Paolo Duterte about uh, me and uh, the West uh, Philippine Sea. Recall that weeks ago, her brother, Congressman Paolo Duterte, said that it is not the job of the vice president to demonize China or any other country for that matter. Party list group Akbayan slammed VP Sara's response once again by saying that her no-comment remarks on China's actions of violence and harassment against Filipinos in the West Philippine Sea epitomizes the most traitorous two words uttered by the second-highest leader of the land. Isang malaking katraidoran. 
It echoes the dangerous depths of her allegiance to China over the well-being and dignity of the Filipino people. Her silence on this issue has been conspicuous because, uh, well, number one, she is the vice president, so second highest official of the land, as the story pointed out. But also because uh, she has been vocal about other things. Mm. For instance, she has openly defended Apollo Kibuloy, whom we all know is, you know, a fugitive officially mm -hmm. at this point. There's warrants of arrest out for him. He is on the US FBI's most wanted list. But a few weeks ago, VP Sara still came out in a video message mm -hmm. defending Kibuloy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Saying that, that, that one aired on SMNI. Even. Correct. Yeah. That, that aired on SMNI, which in itself is in trouble. Uh, <laughs> the, but the lower house uh, voted to revoke its franchise. But anyways, in that video, VP Sara said like, the Senate investigation was unfair, it was trial by publicity. So basically, people's point is that there's nothing stopping her from speaking out on important mm -hmm. issues, right? So what's stopping her well, from speaking out on the West Philippine We know that uh, Filipinos, I mean, when it comes to the West Philippine Sea, uh, mm -hmm. we generally are, I mean, 70% of Filipinos are united on that yes. part. and. Mm -hmm. We do somehow expect the, for the vice president to say something, mm. I mean, apart from the no comment. The leadership to be vocal yes. about it. And in fact, least. when our leaders speak out um, defending Filipino rights, sovereign rights in that area, uh, people applaud that. It's mm. very, very popular. So you're right, it is quite uh, curious because uh, the Duterte's tend to be quite populist, but this is one issue that they're just not Well, touching. we do have to point out that the former president, mm, which is uh, her father, had a very different foreign policy uh, compared to the current administration. Mm -hmm. It's okay, you can say it. Completely opposite end yeah, of the spectrum. Completely <laughs> Pro-China. <laughs> he, 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 he hewed towards China whereas Marcus uh, uh, has uh, more cozied up to Washington as we know. Alright, uh, let's try to get some insights on these latest developments from one of our resident, well, can I say resident? Fa okay, favorite <laughs> geopolitical favorite. analysts. We got guided to Richard. Don McLean Gill. <laughs> Don is a lecturer at the De La Salle University's International Studies Department. Good to have you back, Don. Is it alright that I was claiming you back there? Okay, favorite. No, no, thank you very much. It's a true pleasure to be here. True honor as well. Okay, um, M MCA activity over the weekend. That was the big news, of course. Uh, four nations, the Philippines, the United States, Japan, and Australia. I know officials have taken pains to say that this is not a show of force against China. But what should, how should we read into this, do you think? Right, thank you. And, you know, we have to understand this. So what, when you have a house, when you own a house, you have the license to the house, that house is legally yours, uh, you are entitled to do what you want in order to enhance your house's security, uh, and you are able to do whatever you want to enhance the security of your backyard. Um, however, while it is not directed at anyone, obviously robbers are going to be dissatisfied with this because uh, this comes at the expense of the interests of such robbers who would want to provoke and at least uh, expand towards others' properties. So in that sense, it is clear that it is not for, uh, it is not directed towards any particular party. But uh, if there are certain parties that are dissatisfied with what we are doing based on the law and international law, so to speak, then you know if the shoe fits, right? Uh, but what we're doing is that we are merely upholding what is rightfully ours based on international law in a non-provocative, defense-oriented manner. And this is, I think, very important. And uh, those that are dissatisfied with this, particularly with expansionist interests, uh, would never accept such uh, a defense-related behavior to be defense-related. And thus, we can see the, the provocative statements coming from our northern neighbor. Don, how big of a milestone is this for a country? Help us understand, uh, when we say it's historic, how huge is this for the Philippines? We've been long-time allies with the United States. We have uh, reciprocal access with Japan, visiting forces with Australia. But to get all four countries together at one point, uh, tell us the, the significance and the weight of that. Right, thank you. And I believe it is very significant. I think there's a general consensus on this. Now, this is the product of three very important shared goals by all four states, right? One is to play a larger role as responsible stakeholders of the regional rules-based order. We have Japan and Australia particularly uh, seeking to present themselves as independent forces towards the stability of the region. 
And Manila now is trying to maximize its own agency uh, to represent its role as a responsible stakeholder of the region as well. So that's very important in that regard. Second, you know, to address certain limitations uh, in the traditional hub and spokes format, uh, and in order to push for greater in the, uh, integration between and among the spokes. So this is unprecedented in that regard. And third, of course, is to collectively act. Uh, on shared challenges, right, uh, to individual and collective and even regional peace, which fall towards the interests of all three states. So in this regard, we are seeing a lot of momentum uh, from all four democracies of the Indo-Pacific uh, to harness their roles individually and collectively to ensure uh, that the region remains free, open, and rules-based amid uh, revisionist forces. Right, Don, uh, last month, of course, China held its National People's Congress. Um, they've also been holding combat training, live fire exercises. Um, is this their kind of answer to what we are doing with the MMCA? Or is it just to boost their people's morale, their sentiment, make themselves look uh, really, really tough, especially post-Congress? Right, and it's not only post-Congress, and you're absolutely right with that, is that China has had this strategy of harnessing hyper-nationalist sentiments at home by, of course, engaging in such acts. And this is, of course, a locus of the seat of power of the CCP. Um, and, of course, at the same time, recognizing that China is also wary about engaging in a shooting war, particularly since uh, its military is not battle-hardened, um, it lacks that operational experience, and its last war fought in the 70s, it lost. Um, and in this regard, of course, this show of force, uh, at the very least, uh, aims to deter, right, to deter uh, states such as the Philippines uh, from pursuing what is rightfully theirs based on international law. And this is, of course, another reason how China seeks to, um, you know, seeks to influence public opinion in these states uh, through sharp power, disinformation to show uh, that you are up against a powerful country. And I think that this sort of uh, narrative has been going on all around social media as well, that it, it is often equated that standing up to China always equals going to war with China. But that's not the case. We don't need to go to wars to stand up uh, for what is rightfully ours. And we are seeing that uh, this is the direction in which we are headed right now. This is, uh, of course, coming hot on the heels of the historic trilateral summit about to kick off in two days' time in Washington, D.C. Uh, we already know that boosting defense ties amongst the three countries, uh, Japan, the United States, and the Philippines, is top of the agenda. But what are you hoping to see uh, on a practical term? Right. Thank you. And, you know, this is an opportunity for all three states uh, to deepen their integration beyond the traditional setup of the alliance network in the East. Um, however, because it is emerging, right, uh, much work still needs to be done in order to maximize the utility of this emerging trilateral partnership between Manila, Tokyo, and Washington, right? So this three-way should be multidimensional at the very least, and also sustainable for the long term amidst the multidimensional and protracted challenges that all three states are continuously facing, right? And we're seeing some positive signs uh, in this regard, you know, with the possible announcement of regular trilateral drills. And we've talked about this last time that, you know, I, I did hope that it could be something regular and hopefully that uh, this would materialize. And second, of course, is the creation of uh, cybersecurity cooperative frameworks, which is very vital, especially for the Philippines that has often been the victim uh, of these cyber attacks. Um, and also, at the same time, we are likely to see uh, open discussions on trade and investment. Supply chains for semiconductors uh, would likely be discussed as well. And this is of growing importance amidst the U.S.-China power competition. Um, and this is also in addition to the issues of critical minerals, such as nickel, uh, which, is also, which are also uh, vital. Um, for security and development. So I think these uh, areas would likely be covered in the discussion. And what's most important is that there should be at least a roadmap to what is to come in the next few months and years. And that would really send a message uh, that all three states are willing to take this uh, for the long term. And I believe that that would be very important.
Um, this was in, I think, an hour ago. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning reacted to the trilateral summit. She said, we oppose cobbling together exclusive grouping and stoking block confrontation in the region. Would you like to react to that? Well, I mean, this has been consistent in terms of what they have been advocating for uh, since, you know, we have begun. Manila has become um, more proactive in uh, pursuing uh, what is rightfully ours based on international law. And that is, of course, against the interests of revisionist states um, and expansionist states, of course. So this sort of reaction is expected. Uh, but at the same time, this also shows the realization in Beijing uh, that Manila is unwilling to sit uh, like a vulnerable duck at sea, um, that despite being less powerful, uh, we do recognize that there are several other ways in order to enhance our agency. Uh, in the region. And this is exactly the way forward. Uh, but of course, uh, we would have to maintain consistency uh, in the long run, given the challenges that we have incurred because of such inconsistency. Speaking of agency in the region, Don, um, I think last week we were here discussing this uh, State of Southeast Asia survey by the IC's uh, use of inst Ishak Institute in Singapore, where um, the ASEAN is shown to be a little more, bit more in favor of aligning with China um, versus the United States. I think we're at about 50-50 compared to about 60-40 last year. Um, they did acknowledge, though, that this tends to be kind of a seesawing kind of trend line. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Is it just because of uh, economic help, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, RCEP, what have you? Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, I, I think the uh, State of Southeast Asia survey is very authoritative and it has been a, a great source of uh, information. Um, but of course, uh, going beyond the representation of the survey, uh, when we look into uh, state interaction, particularly in Southeast Asia, um, there is still that unwillingness to choose sides. And I think that this is merely representational of the reality that Southeast Asian states face vis-a-vis uh, -vis their geography towards China, um, their, uh, their uh, deep economic integration with China to the point where uh, political economic decisions cannot be taken independently without factoring in China. Um, and of course, at the same time, it is the intensification of the U.S.-China power competition uh, that continues to uh, uh, you know, trouble uh, Southeast Asian states in this regard. So uh, from this reaction, and if you don't look too much into the numbers and showing that there has been, you know, a, a huge, uh, you know, a tilt towards China in this regard, uh, this has been sort of consistent with how Southeast Asian states act um, and have been acting since the beginning of time. And that is, of course, um, risk averse, uh, survival driven. Um, and uh, and uh, interest driven uh, to that regard. So of course, um, the unwillingness to choose sides will definitely be there. Uh, but of course, there is that realization, growing realization that as China uh, expands its economic integration in the region, uh, it would be harder uh, to decouple from that uh, reality. Um, and this also serves as an opportunity, uh, I'd like to say for other major players uh, to step up uh, their representation in Southeast Asia, such as Japan, Australia, uh, India, France, the UK, in order to serve as alternatives. And that's what Southeast Asian states really need. They don't need to choose. They need more options. And I think this is a call for that. I like that. We don't need to choose, but we do need more options. So here's hoping all those countries you enumerated are uh, tuned in. We're going to have to leave that there. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Geopolitical expert Don McLean Gill. We're going to pause for another quick one right now, but after the break, we will be speaking with former Ilocos Sur Governor Chavit Singson, whose vehicle was flagged for using the EDSA busway this morning.
Welcome back. You're still watching The Big Story here on One News. Former Ilocos Sur Governor Chavik Singh Son's convoy was flagged earlier today by the MMDA for using the EDSA busway. MMDA Special Operations Group Strike Force Head Gabriel Go said Singh Son did not question the violation ticket and asked his driver to surrender his license. In a video statement, Singh Son issued an apology admitting his mistake and acknowledging that it was wrong to use the exclusive bus lane. Drivers who illegally pass through the Edsa bus lane may face penalties of up to 30,000 pesos. It is exclusive to public utility vehicles or buses, on-duty ambulances, fire trucks, and police vehicles. And to talk to us tonight about this, we have none other than the former Ilocosur Governor Chavit Singh Son himself who joins us live via Zoom. Magandang gabi po, Governor. Uh, good evening. Yeah. Gretchen, Sean, and uh, Gina. Good evening, Governor. Governor, uh, un oh, una-una, tatanungin lang po namin sana um, tungkol dun sa insidente nga po. Um, ano po ba yung uh, naging rason kung bakit napadaan po tayo dun sa exclusive bus lane? No, wh whatever it is, uh, sorry ako dahil kasalanan yung driver ko. Uh, wala naman kami sa bus lane, nag-overtake lang dahil walang harang yung yung uh, bus lane. Walang harang nag, nag uh, no, whatever it is kasalanan namin. So kaku multa na lang ako. So nagsorry ako and hindi dapat tularan ako. Hindi dapat gawin ng iba yung Governor ganun. nung section so, po ba yan ng EDSA? Saan ah, po banda? Saan po banda yan? Sa may Aurora Boulevard corner EDSA tama po no, ba? No sa EDSA, EDSA. Oh. Sa Elsa, sa bandang uh, Aurora Boulevard. Sa Aurora Boulevard. But, Talagang uh, hindi siya sadya, pero at the same time, nagsusorry ako dahil mm. but hindi governor, tama. Mas yan, nung, 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 <laughs> walang rason. Talagang mali kami doon. Nakadaan kami. Nag-overtake doon sa bus lane. Hindi naman kami dumaan uh, mismo sa bus lane. Uh, we appreciate, pero kasalanan pa rin uh, namin. Oh, we appreciate your apology, Governor. Pero saan po ba kayo pupunta in a hurry? May hinahabol ako na interview sa Night 25. So, <laughs> yun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, umahabol po kayo sa, sa kasalanan ng media po, gano'n. Kasalanan po. Kinanong mo kasi. <laughs> Nabasa ko nga po yung mga report sa Jario Governor, na may 9 a.m. radio interview kayo. Kaya po nagmamadali yung driver niyo to get it there. Pero alam mo, nagulat ako, Governor, kasi tinawagan niyo daw agad si uh, MMDA Chairman Artes at sinabi niyo na bibigyan oh. ninyo ng TIG 100,000 pesos yung mga oh. enforcer. <laughs> eh, yung violation <laughs> niyo po nasa 30,000. Uh, para may courage silang manghuli, para wag lang naman akong ninuhuli, manghuli, nagbibigay ako ng 100,000 ka ako, so nagbibigay ako ba? Pero sabi niya, mas maganda kung uh, kayo na lang pumunta, sabi niya sa flag ceremony. So pupunta ko ron mismo, mag, uh, mag, uh, mag, kinag-gratulate ko nga yung mga mga huli. Congratulations sa mga mangnang huli at may premium pa sila. Oh. Pero kailangan niyo pa rin po magbayad ng violation. Kasi eh, pinatiket niyo po yung bayad driver. Bayad driver ko and then um, multa pa ako oh. to encourage yung mga enforcers na tama yung ginawa nila. Yung gratulate ko naman silang lahat. Napagalitan niyo po ba yung inyong driver? Hindi, hindi, hindi. Ata, sinasabihan sina, ko lang sila ng premyo. Ah, Governor, hindi ba mapagkamala na bribe yun, hindi premyo? Ha? No, kaya nga hindi ko binigay. Kaya okay. tinabahan ko si Sherman, ibibigay ko hmm. sa para may courage yung mga uh, enforcers para magsipag sila at huli lahat There is uh, para ipakita na nobody's above the law. Mm, so okay. dapat premyuhan yung mga gano'n ng uhuli. Mm, Governor, okay, apansin ko be. lang, may I ask about your car? So because of that incident, no, eh, na-highlight din po na kayo po yung nag-design ng kotse ninyo. Gumagawa uh, na po. Yes. <laughs> yeah, kayo na po ba ay, car designer ng, uh, ngayon? Yes, Pero, kami gumagawa ng body. So uh, customize yun. Kaya nga wala pang plate number eh, dahil yung bibili siya ang magpaparistro uh, noon. So ginagawa namin yung kutsyang yan dahil uh, kami gumagawa yung body. Okay, Mas so... maganda yung gawa sa Pilipinas kaysa mga important na binibili na ganyang klase. Totoo, ang ganda uh, nga po. 
So, yun na po ba ang uh, bagong uh, pinagkakaaliwan ninyo? Uh, is the, does yes. this mean na hindi na kayo magbabalik politika? Or should we expect another go soon? Next year, perhaps? <laughs> Oo, well, uh, busy na ako ngayon nag... Uh, yan, nag, nag, <laughs> gumagawa ng kotse. <laughs> hindi lang nagbebenta ng kotse, gumagawa na ako ngayon. Okay. Out of curiosity, Governor, parehas po ba yung kotse na yon doon sa kotse ni Senator Manny Pacquiao? Mas maganda yan, gawa ng Pilipinas. Gusto ko nga lang oh. na mas maganda ang gawa ng Pilipino. Mga, mga Pilipino, magagaling na silang gumawa. Mas maganda ang dihamak yan, mas mahal yun. <laughs> uh, 24 million yun, yung oh. galing sa Canada, 24 million. Yan, 10 million lang ko binenta. Hey, Governor, babalikan ko lang po yung nangyari itong araw na ito. Bali, first time niyo po ba dumaan doon sa busway? Oh, yes, yes. No, first time na huli pa. Ano po, ano, <laughs> <laughs> ano po yun? Kasi nagmamadali kayo. So yung driver niyo po, o kayo po nagmamadali? Oh, hindi, yung nagahanap driver ang nagkamali. Whatever it is, mali yung driver. Ano po, ano po nga takeaways po natin dito sa so nangyari sa atin? Ha? Ano po ang takeaways po ninyo? Bang? Ano po yung mga lessons po na natutunan <laughs> natin ngayong araw? Uh, umbaga? Well, uh, we, uh, well, dapat nasundin natin lahat ang batas. Kaya nagbigay ang ulang premyo to show, to encourage them. Hmm. And uh, nobody is above the law. Masisino dapat tuliin. Mm -hmm. Pero maybe... Pero, the... pero minsan nakakakita rin ako ng ganyan eh, sa busway. Ay, naku, napakarami. Sa totoo ganyan. lang. At hindi sila nakuli. Parang, parang hindi po kaya yung una nakita ko sa ganyan. Well, di ba hindi yung kasama dun sa mga exempted, ano? Oh, hindi. Yung ganyang klaseng vehicle. Kasi minsan iniisip ko, baka may dalang pera eh. Wow. Baka Ar sasakyan ng pangko eh. Armored vehicle, ganun. Oo. Oh. Oh, tatlo na kasi ang bumili ng ganyan. Kaya eh, uh, customize yan. Kung anong gusto yung customer, <laughs> di ba nang ginagawa namin. Mm -hmm. So, mas kaya nung itsura, nagagawa namin. Mm -hmm. Pero, mas uh, magaling... Mas magaling yung mga Pilipino kaysa mga gumagawa sa imported. And actually, last year, Ay, you uh, tied up with Dongfeng Motors, no, Governor? Uh, can you give us an update on that sa electric vehicle distribution business niyo? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, ang late na kasi binigay yung prototype, mm -hmm. yung uh, mga uh, DOTR and uh, bus, ay mga transport group. So, kabibigyan lang sa akin, dinala ko na kagad sa Korea, matatapos na by May 15 yung uh, prototype. Pagka okay na sa transport group and DOTR, mass production na kami. Dahil uh, ginawa na yung computer, computerized lahat ng paggawa, i-distribute ko naman sa mga manufacturers yun. Nagkisama sa akin sa Korea ng uh, 21 factories ng electric vehicles. Meron kasi bayan uh, probinsya ron na lahat ginagawa electric vehicles. Okay, so, bali po ko. Uh, nakiusap ako na tulungan namin ang mga drivers sa Pilipinas. Sumama na 21 manufacturers. Walang down payment, no guarantee, no, wala kami, hindi kami mamumursyento dahil kung mamumursyento ako, hindi na tulong yun. Kaya tulong lang yung ginawa ko sa, uh, sa atin. So, linawin... Tulong sa mga taong bayan, tulong sa mga drivers, tulong din sa gobyerno. Linawin lang natin, Gov. Matagal, uh, matagal lang program ng gobyerno yan, yung modernization. Hmm, okay. Ay wala naman pera ng drivers. So, hmm. uh, kami na lang mag-provide lahat. Sige. So, linawin lang natin, Governor, no? um, yung partnership niyo with Dongfeng, eh, para gumawa ng modernized Filipino jeepney. Tama po ba? At yun lang... Yes. Dun da yung... Okay, doon lang po ba magtatapos ang inyong partnership o may uh, iba pa kayong plano to expand into uh, hindi yung hindi jeep? Kung baga, pang kotse, normal EV? No, uh, yun ang gusto ng mga transport group. Kinopia ko yung jeep. Kaya lang, mas matas ng konti. Pero, uh, aircon, 22-seater plus 6 ang nakatayo, bali 28 passenger. May idea na ba tayo yung, kung magkano? Yung uh, tricycle, mas marami yung tricycle. Uh, mag magbibigay din ako the same. No down payment, mm -hmm. no porsyento, uh, no guarantee. Ako mag-provide lahat ng tricycle. Tapos na by 17 of this month. Darating na yung prototype. Kasi tinatesting lahat doon ng gear, brake, lahat ng parte. Then ibabanggaan nila. Yun ang last test, yung crash test. So naibanggaan nila, safe mm -hmm. naman yung driver. 
da, darating na rito by 17. Magaroon din, mas marami yung tricycle kaysa electric uh, jeep. So may tricycle, may e-jeep pa, pero magkano kaya yes. nga abutin itong uh, e-jeep ninyo? Pati yung e-trike, magkano po? Pati yung oh. e-trike, o. Oh. Yung, yung uh, jeep, uh, yung jeep, pinahanap po yung pinakamura. Sabi ng uh, transport group, ang pinakamura daw, 2.8, ay uh, 2.6 million. Eh kako kung 2.6 million, pwede ko bigay ng mga 1.2 million. Dahil uh, at cost lang ako, hindi, hindi ako mamumursyento, tulong lang talaga. Kasi kung magbabawas ako ng uh, pursyento, hindi na tulong yun. Eh yun, talagang tulong. Yung e-trike po, magkano po lalabas? Y yung, yung tricycle, baka 170 lang siguro abutin. Hmm. Okay, and, and, pag... Kailan... Yung, uh, dumating na yung pinakita Pero, ko ng picture, uh, uh, darating na 17. Governor, alam po natin na no, pagdating sa EV, isa pang tanong dyan, yung infrastruktura. Kasi parang may sinasabi sila na may anxiety, range anxiety, na kailangan may matcha-charge kayo. Are you also building towards, uh, working on building towards that? Meron po yung mga charging, charging station system. for both uh, vehicle yes. and then the trike. Uh -huh. Yung charging station, mag-provide ako sa mga parking area, parking area nila. Mm -hmm. So, solar ang nalagay ko. Pwede nila i-charge sa bahay nila, pwede rin sa solar parking. Saan pong areas ito, sa... Governor? Anong areas po ito? Ha? Saan areas po ito? Ano, ano? Anong areas po? Ito. Ah, sa mga parking nila, kung saan sila nagpa-park, doon ko ilagay yung solar parking. And, then, and clarify ko lang yung timeline nyo, Governor, no? sabi nyo the prototype will arrive 17 of this month, correct? Yung tricycle. Okay, tapos sa uh, Egypt ni May 15, correct? May 15 naman matatapos yung prototype. Once okay. na approved nila, uh, lahat ang kasamaan ko sa Korea, mass production na kami, May uh, ipapasa ko yung computerized, kukopya nila, madali na lang yun. Cut lang sila ng cut, tapos papadala dito. Dito namin i-assemble. Mga how many days kaya yung ano, uh, between the, the prototype being approved to mass production? Well, depende sa approval nila. Kung as uh, suggested by the transport group and DOTR, yun ang ginawa ko. Now, uh, I-represent ko sa 15 by May, uh, aprobahan nila yon. Then that the time, mass production kami. Hindi ko pwedeng gawin yung hindi na naaprobahan. Mm -hmm. Siyempre, safety first tayo, Governor. Pero maaari ka ba namin imbitahan pagka nag-launch na itong bago mong vehicles <laughs> Ay, para naman yes. ma-demo mo nyo sa amin wag at lang, maipakita. Huwag lang sa EDSA Busway po. Pero hindi sa EDSA Busway. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Okay, papa. Papa lo sa inyo. Oh, sige, but, sige, salamat. Wait, ko. wait, before we let you go, Governor, sorry, last two questions sa lang for me. Uh, clarify ko lang what your plans are for 2025 if you've decided. Yung 2025 po elections, may plano na po ba tayo? Ah, wala, wala. Wala, matagal na ako dito, si mayor, hindi ako tumakbo din last election eh. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, Nagbebenta na lang tayo ng kotse. Magagawa ng kotse, nagbebenta ng kotse. Nag nagbebenta ng uh, bakal. Dahil yung bakal natin, parang tulong na rin sa tao dahil iba na yung bakal ngayon. Ang bakal tumataas ng presyo. Ngayon, meron akong factory sa Korea na rebars na fiberglass. Yeah. Hindi na bakal. For uh, roads and bridges, bahay. Uh, hindi na kinakalawang. Okay. Mas magaan pa, mas mura. And uh, mas mati twice stronger than steel, uh, four times lighter than steel, and hindi na kinakalawang. Mm -mm. And then, uh, very quickly, I wonder if alam mo uh, nung plano ni uh, your good friend, uh, former Senator Manny Pacquiao for 2025. At tutulungan ko siya, si Manny Pacquiao. Siya. I was the one who encouraged him to run to again for the Senate. Hmm. So, confirm that he will run again in 2025? Yes, yes. I didn't want to go to the birthday. I was I to go to the I to go to the game. Did you siya in 2025? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Okay, madami kayong ganap pa, uh, Governor. Dami nyo palang business ventures ngayon. Kala namin na uh, nananahimik na kayo. Pero go, go, go. May iba pa ba kayong business ventures na pwede ka namin i-follow up bukod sa inyong uh, fiberglass rebars and sa e-vehicles nyo? Marami. <laughs> Maka maubos yung oras. Maka maubos. Sabi nila, nag-advertise ako sa inyo. <laughs> Pero marami. Marami. Puro karamihan tulong. Okay. Uh, like yung rebars, uh, mas mura na sa bakal yun. Okay. Mas uh, magandang gamitin natin. We'll, uh, we'll invite you another time, Governor. Uh, for now, we're, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you for, jo for joining us. And please stay off the EDSA busway. That was former Ilocos <laughs> Governor Chavit Singh. So thank you for, for your time. We're going to pause for another quick break. Right after that, a recent Octus research survey shows that more Filipinos identify as pro-Marcos compared to those who say that they are pro-Duterte. The details when we return, keep it here. Welcome back. You're still watching the big story here in One News. It's like the tail wagging the dog. That's exactly how President Marcos described Apollo Kiboloy demanding certain conditions for his surrender, including that the U.S. not be allowed to interfere in his case. Kiboloy remains a fugitive, though authorities believe that he is still in the country. Let's bring in Rainiel Pawid for the rest of that big story. Rainiel, what else did the president have to say about Pastor Apollo Kibuloy? Sean, as you know, Pastor Apollo Kibuloy is currently wanted by the NBI after a Davao court called for his arrest over sexual and child abuse cases. Kibuloy, though, refuses to surrender unless there is a guarantee letter that the U.S. will not intervene in his case. This did not sit well with President Marcos. It seems to me a little bit uh, uh, tail wagging the dog. Tawag, na siyang magbibigay ng kondisyon sa uh, gobyerno doon sa kaso niya. Akusado siya sa warrant of arrest. President Marcos adds that Kibuloy should respect the court's decision and face the justice system, especially since there is strong evidence against him. We will exercise all the compassion. Uh, uh, to, to, to Pastor Kibuloy. We've known him for a very long time. And uh, ang, ang may papangako ko, the all the proceedings will be fair. Now, as to the involvement of the United States, we, malayo pa yan eh. That, that's going to take years yet. Yeah? So I don't think that's something he needs to worry about, quite frankly. Now, if you ask Vice President Sara Duterte, an ally of Kibuloy and someone who has previously expressed support for the pastor. She described it as a good development, the way the cases against Kibuloy have progressed, as charges have now been filed in the court, which is described as the proper venue. 
But when asked if she will help defend her friend, here's what she said. Senators are meanwhile getting impatient over Kibuloy's refusal to face them following the release of a separate arrest order over his absence in their ongoing probe. Pastor Kiboloy, lumabas ka na sa lungga mo. Total, nagpapa-interview ka naman sa mga vlogger. Magpa-interview ka na rin sa amin sa Senado. Hindi naman na itago ng audio file ang takot ninyo mula nung umalingasaw ang katotohanan. Sean, for now, the NBI is continuing its manhunt operations against Kiboloy. They are also confident that the pastor has yet to leave the country. Sean. Thanks so much for that, Rainiel Pawid. But Kibaloy's legal team isn't buying the assurances from government. His lawyer, attorney Ferdinand Topasho, spoke to One News Afternoon Program StoryCon and said this case was extraordinary and politically charged. If there is such a thing as a whole of uh, uh, government approach, this is it. Uh, with respect to Pastor Kiboloy. <laughs> At <laughs> bakit ngayon lamang nagkaroon ng uh, ganitong confluence of events? Uh, isang uh, magandang argumento dyan na ni-raise ni Atty. Torion, ay eh, yun nga nga the question of delay in the uh, Department of Justice. But because in so many cases, uh, hindi nga inabot ng uh, apat na uh, taon Uh, ilang taon lamang at sinabi ng at Korte Suprema na uh, that is already a violation of the right to speedy trial and the result of that, since it is an unconstitutional act, is that it voids the indictment. So marami po eh. Uh, mm. This is not uh, a plain and simple case na uh, inimbestigahan, may warang, at uh, this is a politically charged case, especially right now under the present uh, administration. Well, in other news, it was quite a busy day today for the President and the Vice President. First up, we have President Marcos leading the ceremonial energization of the recently completed Cebu Negros Panay 230kV subgrids in Bacolod City. The nearly 68 billion peso project provides additional power supply in Iloilo, Negros Occidental and Cebu. President Marcos said the facility will respond to the surging energy needs of the area and boost economic development. He also called on the NGCP to ensure the timely completion of the key power projects, which he said will help the country secure more foreign investments. Power outages are a hindrance to progress. Our power system must be the spark to ignite development. We have taken a big step uh, in uh, today uh, when we open this uh, transmission and this transmission network in making this more attractive to other private investors uh, to come in and to help us with the problem and to um, bring their own uh, capacities to, uh, to, to uh, improving the transmission lines, even the power generation. Moving over to the office of the Vice President, Education Secretary Sara Duterte graced the Youthpreneur event in Pasig that was hosted by DepEd and Go Negosyo. This program is designed to promote an entrepreneurial mindset among the youth through mentorship and talks. The event gathered nearly a thousand senior high school students at Rizal High School. After the event, she was asked by reporters about the latest surveys, showing she was the top presidential bet alongside Senator Rafi Tulfo. And this was her response. Napakalayo pa kasi uh, ng 2028 para natin na uh, pag-usapan siya ngayon. Ang ginagawa lang natin ngayon at kailangan natin gawin lahat ay uh, magtrabaho muna. Uh, mag-contribute tayong lahat uh, sa nation building. Before we go, we're leaving you with our big pictures tonight. And these are photos of total solar eclipses in the past or eclipses in the past as the world awaits the occurrence of a new one in just a few hours. Now remember that in a total solar eclipse, the moon passes between the sun and earth, totally blocking the face of the sun. This eclipse is expected by NASA to begin at 11.07 a.m. Pacific time in the United States. That's 2 a.m. Philippine time, April 9. However, sad news for us Filipinos because the eclipse will not be visible at all from here in the Philippines. Instead, it will pass over North America, including Mexico, the United States, and Canada, where sky gazers have been preparing to witness this rare celestial event. 
Pagasa says the next total solar eclipse that can be viewed from the Philippines will happen in 2042. And that will be visible from Legazpi City. 2042, that's I'm so counting, far away. Counting, I'm still alive. Counting the ages. <laughs> I'm like, wait, am I going to be alive to see that? That's so far away. Have you ever, though, do you remember like seeing a solar eclipse maybe when we were in first grade? Probably, or, yes. It's I'm not born, siguro, no? Maybe oh, you weren't na. born or maybe you had just been born, but I was already in school. And I remember our teacher was guiding what us. What happened? That you're not supposed to look at it like directly. Dilimba. No, we had oh. glasses. Oh yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, the, we had like a weird the paper oh, glasses. Like it's kind of it looks like a cellophane. Oh, but yung, I could be the wrong. Paper, the the cardboard oh, with so the cellophane. Oh, so you cardboard with cellophane. Oh, yeah. yeah, and then okay. you you wear it. We were all in the playground. That playground was demolished already uh -huh. by my school, by the way. But I remember I was probably seven when I last saw it. So it was quite dim because of the eclipse. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. it's it was it, it, was suddenly, it? I, it, I mean, if you're in the path of Totality, what they call oh, the path of totality. totality. It, go, go, it grows dark in the ah, middle of the day. Uh -oh. Perhaps <laughs> it was not a total eclipse Maybe. that I saw, but uh -oh. only partial house had. So but the goal now case, is, the goal to, make is it. to not look at it directly if you are in the path. If you are in a, another country, it. the US. Mm. I thought the goal was to make it to 2042 to travel to Legaspi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for the big story tonight. We have no more time. Uh, it is a Monday, a holiday tomorrow, and, and on Wednesday. Wednesday. Not for us, the news will have to. I think the news keeps going. I guess. Well, enjoy your break to those who are uh, on it. We are one news all sides all the time. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow.